following lecture was produced by Glorianne Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. Theophany or Christophany of the Bodhisattva. <coughs> Only those who had developed the Bodhicitta in themselves and who have renounced to all nirvanic happiness for the love of humanity can qualify themselves as bodhisattvas. The alchemist who does not sacrifice himself for humanity can never become a bodhisattva. Only the bodhisattvas with compassionate heart who have given their life for humanity can incarnate the intimate Christ. We must make a complete differentiation between the Sravakas and Buddha's Pratyekas on one side and the Bodhisattvas on the other. The Sravakas and Buddha's Pratyekas only preoccupy themselves with their particular perfection without caring a bit for this wretched suffering humanity. Obviously, the Buddha's Pratyekas and Sravakas can never incarnate Christ. Only the Bodhisattvas who sacrifice themselves for humanity can incarnate Christ. The sacred title of Bodhisattva is legitimately attained only by those who have renounced to all nirvanic happiness for the love of suffering humanity. Obviously, before the Bodhisattva is born, the Bodhicitta must be formed within ourselves. Furthermore, it is important to clarify the necessity of disintegrating the ego, the I, in order for the Bodhicitta to emerge. The Bodhicitta is formed with the merits of love and supreme sacrifice for our fellow men. The Bodhisattva is formed within the environment and psychological atmosphere of the Bodhicitta. We must not make the mistake of mistaking the, bodhis the Bodhicitta with the Bodhisattva. The Bodhicitta is the awakened and developed superlative consciousness of the being. The bodhicitta emerges in the aspirant who sacrifices himself for his fellow men long before the mercurial bodies had been created. So here, of course, we are arriving <coughs> at the level of Tifereth, which according to the tree of life, is a sixth sephira, which cabalistically is uh, named the Son of Man. 
it is important to clarify here different aspects by utilizing now the tree of life. So we invite the people that are listening to utilize the tool that we have in the website of the tree of life. Since we are going to point at the tree of life during the course of this lecture, in order for you to understand why we are utilizing the tree of life, Kabbalah, in order to explain the Bible, because the whole Bible is a Kabbalistic book. Let us remember, for instance, that when we enter into the aspects of Christianity related with Buddhism, we refer to the four Gospels and specifically to the letters, the epistles of Paul of Tarsus, who was a Gnostic rabbi. It is important to understand that before Paul of Tarsus became a Gnostic, which between parentheses, Gnostic is somebody that knows and practices the mystery of Da'at. Da'at is a tree of knowledge of good and evil. In Greek, that is Gnosis. That Gnosis translates as knowledge. As you know, is always related with a sexual force. So when Paul of Tarsus knew about that, about Gnosis, and then he became a Gnostic Kabbalist. And it's important to comprehend here that the one that started explaining to him the mystery of that, which is directly related with Tifereth, uh, the one that started was the Apostle Peter. If you read the Gospels, you will find how in the book of Acts, Paul of Tarsus, a rabbi, because he was, of course, a master, a rabbi. Rabbi means teacher, master of Kabbalah, of Judaism. He was persecuting the Gnostics. We won't say Christians, because at that time, Christianity was unknown. The word Christ comes from the Greek language, and later on the Gnostics were named Christians. But at that time, of course, the mystery of that Gnosis was uh, being spread among the Kabbalists. And uh, this is something very sacred and secret. Paul of Tarsus was, of course, one of those uh, rabbis at that time that was enraged because of that uh, aspect. But he was the one that was uh, chosen <coughs> by the master, or we will say by Christ, in order to teach the mystery of that Gnosis to the Gentiles. In other words, those who were not Hebrews, Israelites. So, of course, as being a Kabbalist that he was, he was teaching this doctrine based on the tree of life, based on Kabbalah. So when we study the letters of Paul, if we do not know Kabbalah, if we ignore the tree of life, we don't know what he is talking about. And that's precisely the problem of Christianity since they uh, study the Bible and they push aside Kabbalah, the tree of life, 
because they think that it's an obscure science. And therefore, they uh, fall into the mistake of interpreting the Bible according to uh, in accordance with their their own minds, ignoring the symbols, the deep meanings of the tree of life. So when we enter into the is, this aspect of uh, the lecture, which is the theophany or Christophany, is also called. It is related with the manifestation of Christ or the appearance of the mystery of Christ before the initiate before that bodhisattva in the sixth dimension which the Bible called the Mount of Olives symbolically in the Gospels you find different names or different mounts that exist in the physical plane but they were taken as a symbol in order to explain certain things for the people to understand. When you go up into the mountain, into the mount, it's of course the symbol of going out of your body into the fourth, fifth, or sixth dimension. In this case, the Mount of the Olives is related with Tiferet, which in the Tree of Life is the sixth Sephira where we find the monad. In many lectures, we explain that the monad is a trio of spirit, divine soul, and human soul. Monad is from the Greek word monas, which means unity. So each one of us has his own monad, his own spirit. And we are, of course, part of it. We are souls, but embryos of souls. And here it starts precisely explaining what Paul of Tarsus talks in one of uh, his epistles. Especially this letter to the Corinthians, chapter 15, that we always refer and explain. He says, And as we have born, this means hold up, support, the image of the psychological man, that's precisely the translation, the Soma Suchikon, as we always explain, that in the Bible is translated as earthly man, which it is a translation uh, adequate, of course, or placed according to the mind of people, but really the real translation is psychological or psychic man. We shall also bear hold up or support the image of the heavenly man or as we say in Greek the soma pneumaticon soma is body a pneuma is a spirit icon or icon is image so when you read the Bible in Corinthians chapter 15 verse 49 you read and as we have borne the image of the earthly man, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. Literally. So when people read that, they think that we are already the earthly man. Or the Soma Suchikong, the psychological man. Gurdjieff talks about that psychological man that we need to develop by super efforts. Or as Buddhism explains, with meditation and different practices in order to awake the consciousness, the psychic, the psyche. But Paul of Tarsus also referred to the bodies of sin. He talks different uh, epistles or letters 
about the bodies of sin or the sinful or uh, natural bodies, natural sinful bodies. And uh, fundamentalists do not know how to explain that because they ignore the tree of life and they ignore about the science of that, which is Gnosis, the science of the tree of good and evil. To begin, we have to start to explain that we have an embryo of soul. In other words, we have the capability of becoming a human being if we put in activity the icon, the image, the talent of God with the signs of the tree of good and evil, which is Tantra, which is alchemy, sexual transmutation. So this embryo of soul abides within the bodies of sin, which Paul of Tarsus talked about Gnostically, Kabbalistically, in the New Testament. These bodies of sin are the natural bodies that anybody has. And we always point at these bodies of sin by studying the four sephirot below in the tree of life which are Netzach, Hod, Yesod, and Malkut. This is the inferior quaternary. These are called the bodies of sin. Why are they called the bodies of sin? Because these bodies obey only to the laws of evolution and devolution. Those are the bodies that evolve and devolve according to the will of samsara, according to the laws of nature. The bodies of sin are the mental body, the emotional body, which are called protoplasmic bodies, which belong to the fifth dimension. The fifth dimension is related with Nesach and Hod. Below the fifth dimension, we have Yesod, related with the fourth dimension, in which we find the vital body or the ethereal body. And below this ethereal body we have, of course, our physical body that we use here, that we have. These four bodies, Nitzahod, Yasod, and Malkut, mental, emotional, vital, and physical, are what Paul of Tarsus called the bodies of sin or the sinful nature that only obey the law, the mechanical law of nature. These bodies, you find them in the mineral kingdom, in the plant kingdom, in the animal kingdom. It's not just a property of the humanoid or the intellectual animal. The difference is that the physical body that we have is evolved of evolution, physically speaking. And the protoplasmic, emotional, mental bodies that we have within are also in the summit of evolution. That's the limit. And this is something that uh, when you study, for instance, any animal, Irrational animal, you find that they have protoplasmic bodies too, but they don't have intellect. Their protoplasmic bodies are still in evolution. 
And in the mineral kingdom, plant kingdom, you also find the same bodies in the lower evolution. They evolve from the bottom to the top. The top of that is the mind. This is it. No more. So when they reach the level in which we are, these protoplasmic bodies, along with the physical body, start to devolve, to decay, to return into its own source, the origin, the chaos. This is why the book of Revelation called the second death. Which means the annihilation of those protoplasmic bodies in another span of time. If you see here, for instance, emotion and mind are related to the fifth dimension. And time span in the, time di uh, in the fifth dimension is different. In this physical world, you receive your matter, your body, and a certain age, let's say an average of 80 years, you live, you die, and that body decays and turns into dust. That's called death. That happens to everybody. So the protoplasmic bodies evolve, grow up in different dimensions. From the mineral kingdom, plant kingdom, animal kingdom, and when they reach the intellectual animal, they reach the summit and they start to evolve to go down, to get old, in other words. And they sink after that into the infra dimensions of nature in order to die. That's a process. It's a natural process. When they devolve, they work according with the devolving laws of the cosmos and nature. And this is precisely the problem for the embryo of soul, because we are always inside the protoplasmic bodies, according to the mechanicity of nature. That's why it is stated that we have to be born again in order to enter into the kingdom of heaven. That birth is something practical in which you utilize your sexual energy in which you extract the icon, the talent in Hebrew, image in English, of God, from your own sexual matter, and create within you the glorious bodies, or the bodies of glory that Paul of Tarsus talk about. And that the mystery, that is the mystery of that, of the, no, uh, of the mystery of the tree of good and evil, tree of knowledge. Without knowing the secret of sexual transmutation, it's impossible to be born again. Because we have to create, while in different lectures we are explaining little by little, the Soma Suchi Kong. This is what Paul of Tarsus talk. And that in the Bible is translated as terrestrial or earthly men. It is in reality is psychological or psychic men. And to bore or to bear in this case the image of that man, for that you have to understand what is to bear. Even the past tense of that word, born, is related with birth. You have to be born. And uh, in the Corinthians chapter 15, verse 49, it says, As we have born the image of the psychic man, the earthly man, meaning that he's talking to those that already made that creation within themselves is not to bear something in your mind because people think that you have to bear the image of the psychological man or the earthly man to bear it and they think, oh, I have to imagine or to understand in my mind what is that and that it, that it is. So in the same way that we born the image of the earthly man, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. 
And then people said, oh, uh, oh uh, that means that I have to image as well to understand, to comprehend, and to imagine how the heavenly men might be. Uh, and that has nothing to do with imagining anything but doing it. Sir has said, for instance, to bear, to hold up is to bear, to support. Support something that is in the bottom in order to build something. Foundation. That's why we are always pointing that Yesod is related with the sexual organs. And the translation of Yesod from the Hebrew into English means foundation. What is foundation? Foundation is the lowest support or structure. You see? The lower support or structure. And what is to bear? To hold up or to support? We also say that women bear children. Yeah, as well. We also say that women bear children. You see that? So it's not a statement related with believing in something or imagining something. It's to do something with your sexual force. To bear a child, like a woman bear the child inside, is how you have to bear the image of the heavenly man. But there is a tantra, there is a transmutation, chastity, that you have to know in order to do it. That's why when we talk about this, we find when Jesus appears in the book of John, the Gospel of John, and he finds Peter. Peter, he says, thou shalt be called Cephas, which by interpretation is a stone, a rock. Then in Matthew, he says, Matthew 16, verse 18 and 19, he says to Peter, you are a rock. And I said also unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt lose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then... Peter himself, who is the rock, the support, he says, Behold, he says in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 6 and 8, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief corner stone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you, therefore, which believe, he is precious. But unto them, which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner, and a storm of stumbling, and a rock of offense. Many times, and in the website, we talk about the word believe. Believe which is something that you have to perform with the, all your being inside of you, with the libido, the sexual energy. So then, Peter, whose sacred name is Patar, means stone, Cephas. Peter, in other lectures, we explain very clear that is related with the pineal gland. We explain that the 12 apostles are related with 12 glands in the physical body that we have to work with. And of course, the pineal gland is in relation with Keter. Remember that Keter is the first sephira of the tree of life which in Hebrew means crowned. And this aspect of this trinity, Keter, Chokmah, Binah, of the tree of life, 
is always related with the head. So Keter is exactly on the top of the head. It is what the, in Sanskrit is called the chakra sahasrara, or the crown chakra, related with the pineal gland. When we study endocrinology, we discover that the pineal gland is that gland that is an intimate relation with the sexual glands, whether the ovaries of the woman or the testicles in the man. And of course, the mystery of that is a sexual mystery. But the way in which we control that sexual matter and liberate him, which Peter, in his epistle, is talking about, he says, who believe in him. Who is that him? It's a Christic force. It's Christ. It's the image of God that Paul of Tarsus talks about. It's precisely that suchikon, or psychic icon, that we have in the sex. The power, the image of God is hidden within the sexual force. So, if we liberate that image, which is him, that Paul of Tarsus talk, then we build the church. The church in itself is the internal bodies that we have to build. It's not related, of course, as people think, that uh, Peter is the head of the church, the Catholic church, or any other religion. That, of course, in order for somebody to be a head of any physical religion, he has to build first his own temple inside. In order to be a priest and to ritualize as Peter, the first apostle, you have also to build what Peter built in him, which is the bodies of glory. That's why Paul of Tarsus is also called one of the heads of the church, because he teaches how to build those bodies that we are talking here, which in Buddhism we are calling them the bodhicitta. The psychological work that we have to do in order to build the vehicle of the Lord. Master Samael says that the bodhisattva has to grow inside the bodhicitta. We will say, in other words, Tifereth, which is related with Soma, Neumaticon. Remember that we stated that Neuma is a spirit. Remember that we said that the spirit is in relation with the monad. The monad is our own particular spirit. So in order for us to bear the spirit, the monad, first we have to bear the psychological, the soul, to build, in other words, inside of us, the Soma Suchi Kong. He's saying clearly there, in the same way that we born the psychological man, now we have to, to bear the spiritual man. And this is a process of alchemy, transmutation, which Peter teaches, because the sexual transmutation is the science of Peter. Because Peter is in relation with the pineal gland. Peter teaches internally how to create within you the Soma Suchi Kong and the Soma Neumati Kong. Without the science of Peter, it's impossible. And this is how Paul of Tarsus learned and how he teaches. But behold here the great mistake of the fundamentalists that they think that they have just to imagine about bringing into their mind the image of the terrestrial man and the heavenly man. And they think that they already are the terrestrial man. No. The bodies of sin 
had to be annihilated, had to be disintegrated, had to die. Because, uh, how to say, the wage of sin is death. This is something that we have to comprehend by studying the tree of life. When you start transmuting your sexual energy, and then you start, as the as Paul of Tarsus says, fighting against beasts, against demons from the abyss in Ephesus. In the book of Revelation, they talk about the church of Ephesus. And in many Gnostic lectures, we explain that the church of Ephesus is the chakra Muladhara, which is precisely located between the anus and the genitals. That's the magnetic center where the sexual force that has to rise in the spinal column abides. And we start fighting in the beginning there with beasts. With which beasts? Our own particular bestiality, animal lust that we have within. Because that beast that we have, which are related with the protoplasmic bodies, will fight. The protoplasmic bodies are animal bodies that used to fornicate to adulterate. That's normal for the protoplasmic bodies. That's why when you study animals, irrational animals, they fornicate and they commit adultery. That is normal. But when we enter into this level of humanoid or intellectual animal, we receive cuts, lust, knowledge, in order to create the human being within in order to fight against the laws of the animals. And of course, that is a fight. Because that fight is precisely in the very sexual act. One begins, as if one is single, to transmute the sexual energy with techniques of pranayama, breathing exercises. But when we get married, then we start practicing sexual magic. And every time that we perform the sexual act, there is a fight against the beasts, against the demons of the abyss, which are within. Lust, precisely, is the main one. And by fighting in Ephesus, is how we start growing inside and building the Soma Su Chi Gong, the soul man, the psychic man within, which has a process that we explained in the previous lecture. The physical body becomes the body of liberation, a superior body that belongs to the fourth dimension. And then we find here. Uh, the body of gold, which is made with the two superior ethers of the vital body. And the body of gold and the body of liberation became united and make that physical body which is immortal. Which is a physical body that does not belong to this sinful nature that we have in this physical body. Because this physical body that we have here in this physical world was created through fornication. My mother fornicated with my father and then she got pregnant and then I get this physical body. So it's the outcome of fornication. But when I transmute my sexual energy, I start transmuting it and then I start creating inside of me by hypostasis, as we were explaining in the other lecture, the body of liberation and the golden body which are two superior parts of Malkut and Yasad. And that is precisely working with the bodies of glory. Then we create the body of Hod, which is called the astral emotional superior body. 
and the body of Netzah, which is the mental superior body. Bodies that comes from chastity, from transmutation. That is precisely what the Bible talks in Genesis. That God made the human being into his own image. That is the human being into the image of God that we extract from the sexual transmutation because that image that in Hebrew is called Salem is within the sexual energy of man and woman. Now you understand why the pact of Abraham with God is the circumcision. And every religion points always at the sex in relation with this being born again. The fundamentalists think that they just believe in something and they are born. They call themselves twice born just because they believe in what is written in the Bible. In order to be a twice born, you have to do this that we're explaining here. To build the Soma Suchikon, which Paul of Tarsus talks about. To bear the image of that within you. And as you born that image within you, through the signs of that, of sexual transmutation, then you bear the image of the Neumaticon, or the heavenly man, which is above, which is different, in which we are entering right now. Let us read again something here for you to understand in relation with the Bible. He says, The Mount of Olives. I told you that the Mount of Olives is different. In the book of Zechariah, chapter 4, verse 11 to 14, it is written, Then answered I and said unto him, What are these two olive trees upon the right side of the candlestick and upon the left side thereof? And I answered again and said unto him, What be these two olive branches, which through two golden pipes empty the golden oil unto themselves? And he answered me and said, Knowest thou not what this be? And I said, No, my lord. Then said he, These are the two anointed ones that stand by Adonai Haaretz, which means the Lord of the earth. If you read this, you don't understand what are you reading. If you don't know the tree of life, you don't know the mystery of that. If you ignore that the Mount of the Olives is Tifereth, the sixth dimension, which is where the spirits abide beyond the fifth dimension because the fifth dimension is eternity and that which is beyond eternity is the spirit, the sixth dimension. There is where you find the Mount of Olives, symbolically speaking. But here, how do we know what is that Mount of the Olives related with the physical plane? Well, we will say, we said already, that the Mount of the Olives related with this planet Earth, well, you go to the Middle East and you find the Mount of the Olives there. And all those uh, mounts that the Bible talks about in the Gospel. But related with our own particular Earth, our philosophical Earth, which is called physical body, which is also Malkut, the three-dimensional world, this three-dimensional body of mine has its own particular Mount of Olives too. And is a pineal gland. Here. Here is where the two branches which are side by side of the temple. Alchemically, psychologically we say the temple, the physical body, is a temple. 
that we have to clean within which God must abide. If we have to do the psychological or chemical work in order to do that. But for that, we have to liberate the oil which in Zachariah is talking about. This oil is precisely the sexual image of God which is rising in the spinal column. From the very bottom of your coccyx to the pineal gland. With that energy rises there as the oil of the lamp. As if you have a lamp of oil, you will understand that. The oil is in the bottom. Then you put the wick and the light shines in the very top of that lamp. Now, if you understand that that wick is the spinal column or the medulla, spinal medulla, and that the flame has to go on the top, which is the pineal gland, you understand then what is the fire of Pentecost, which is that precisely energy, solar force, which is rising from your own oil, which is precisely the sexual matter, sexual energy, rises to the two cords, the two branches, which in the book of Genesis are called Adam and Eve, the lunar and solar force, Ida and Pingala, Yin and Yan, all the know, received many names in different religions. The fact is that we have those branches, those conducts through which the solar oil, the force of God, rises to the Mount of the Olive. And this is how the soul is being created. Because many times we say that we are not human beings. That means that the hume, the spirit, is not united with our mind. And that we are only embryos of human. That embryo is called budata. And that we always explain here that we have to work with that budata. We have to put in activity that material, psychological element that we have within. To work with it, with that burata, implies transmutation. Because that burata has to grow up. In the same way that we need a sexual energy in order to create a child, and we need to feed a child in order to grow up, in the same way we need to create this soma suchi kong within, that Paul talks about. That is the soul man. That soul man, that Su Chi Kong, image of God, is the human being into the image of God. That is how that uh, image emerges from within. So you have to understand that in order to stop believing that we are made into the image of God if we read literally Genesis. We can be made into the image of God if we know how. And that the Soma Suchikon, the bodies of glory that we have to create by working with the Bodhicitta. Of course, Master Samael on the or says, that before the Bodhisattva appears, the Bodhicitta has to appear. But there are many people that are not Bodhicittas. They are just building their solar bodies without taking care a bit for humanity. They don't care about humanity. They are just build their bodies. They are called Sravakas. So you have to make a, different, a difference here about what is a Sravaka, and what is a bodhicitta? A bodhicitta is precisely what Paul of Tarsus talks, the Soma Suchi Kong, that we elaborate, that we build through meditation, comprehension, and annihilation of the animalistic elements that we have them within. And by creating the image of God, which is that Soma Suchi Kong, or the psychological bodies, 
which the Master Samael or alchemists call mercurial bodies. And that's why it is necessary to know the science of alchemy, the science of the tree of good and evil, in order to comprehend what we are talking about. So many individuals, initiates, create within themselves the four bodies of glory. But they never sacrifice themselves for humanity. They never disclose, they never talk about it. Those type of individuals that build that within are called sravakas in Sanskrit, which means only people that care about themselves. But when you are doing it to yourself and you see the benefits that you are receiving by building the image of God within you, that soma suchikon that the Bible talks about, that the Poles talk about, then you also want other people to build that and to understand that the soma suchikon, the image of God, is something that we have to build. And by doing that, by teaching that, by sacrificing yourself for your fellow man and teaching the doctrine, then you are building bodhicitta. So the bodhicitta is something that emerges when one sacrifices oneself for our fellow man. When, I, when one is not selfish. So it's impossible for somebody to develop the bodhicitta when this, body, uh, with this person is just doing for himself and don't talk about being selfish. Of course, this type of sravaka, when he enters into the world of Tifereth, he becomes a Buddha Pratyeka, meaning somebody that is selfish, somebody that gained a lot of uh, uh, levels of spirituality, but in the lower level. He cannot become Bodhisattva. Bodhisattva is a title that one has to gain long before creating the mercurial bodies. That's why there are many initiates there that are teaching bodhicitta, that are teaching the people how to awake, and still they are not merry. One of them, for instance, a good example, which we always point, is Yogananda. Yogananda is a beautiful example of bodhicitta without mercurial bodies. He started working in himself psychologically, and he came to America teaching that. And still people practicing what he taught. But unfortunately, he didn't build the, the bodies of glory that Paul of Tarsus talked about, the Soma Suchikong. But he awoke a lot of consciousness, and he, because he sacrificed himself for humanity, he built a lot of bodhicitta. Now he will have to return and to build the glories of body or the image of God within himself, and he can become a bodhisattva because he already had that love for humanity within. It's something that is natural in the bodhisattva. He was not married because he thought that he could perform the whole work by being single. And that was his mistake. Because in order to create a child in this physical world, I need a woman. And a woman is a man. In order to create, we need the two polarities. And Yogananda thought that by uniting the two polarities within, that was enough. But he ignored that there were a separation of sexes in order to build that purpose. That's why in the beginning God was androgynous, or the man was androgynous, but was divided into sexes in order to perform this that we are explaining here in this lecture. So then understand that humanity that in this very moment lives in the face of the earth is not formed by humans, but humanoids. Because we have the shape of humans, physically speaking. But psychologically speaking, we need to build the Soma Suchikong. We need to build the 
bodies of glory, which are related with the inferior quaternary, with those four sephiroth that we always explain here. We have to build an astral solar body, a mental solar body, the body of glory, the body of Netzah. Alchemically, the astral body is called the child of gold, our own particular inner Christ. And the mental body is called our own inner particular Jehovah that holds the wisdom of nature within. Which, in other lectures, in the previous lecture, we explained that it's related with Elias. So here, you are entering into what we have to comprehend, these two aspects. Because in order to enter into the world of Tifereth, the Bodhisattva, we have to work with the signs of Peter. And Peter is the one that has the keys of heaven and earth, and even of hell. If you remember what uh, we said, that... Uh, the Lord says in the Bible, in the book of John, Whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou you, you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. That is in relation, of course, with the sign of alchemy. When you read in the Bible that Jesus goes into the Mount of the Olives, he takes three disciples, always. Peter, John, and Jacobo. I say Jacobo because really that's the most uh, uh, tri right translation. Because in the Bible, in English, it's called James. I don't know why it is called James. Because in Greek, it says Jacobo. Or in Hebrew, it's Jacob, in other words. And in, in, in Spanish, it says Santiago. But San, which means a contraction of saint. Iao or Jacobo. Jacobo. It's a contraction. So in Spanish, it makes more sense. But in English, James, well, is a modification of, of Jacobo. But it really is uh, uh, Peter, John, and Jacobo. This Jacobo... Is symbolized by having in his head sometimes a pumpkin or sometimes holding in his hand the half of a pumpkin and in the other hand the book of Revelation. So then you find there that Jesus takes only three disciples to the Mount of the Olives. Peter, which obviously, Peter is always related with it. Peter is related with the pineal gland. Always a state that. And uh, in other lectures we stated that also in the pineal gland we have the relationship of Moses. Moses go also to the Mount of Sinai, which is that in this, in this case is another symbol for the same Mount, in which he sees God. Theophany, Christophany, means the way in which you see God. That happens in the Bible many times. You see how the prophets talk with God. Moses saw God face to face. But when people read that he went into the Mount of Sinai and saw God face to face, they think that it was physical. They don't understand that the Mount of Sinai or the Mount of the Olives is related with the pineal gland. So, of course, when you work in Buddhism, in meditation, you understand very well the importance of the activity of the pineal gland. Because in the pineal gland, we have 
the soul. The activity of the, that memory, remembrance of oneself. When you are remembering yourself second after second, moment after moment, and you feel yourself within the body, the center of gravity of that memory, of that attention, is in the pineal gland. And if you observe yourself, you will see there that always when you are remembering yourself, you find even a pressure in the pineal gland, a palpitation there. Because it's the activity of the neuma, of the spirit, of the soul that we have. Whether this soul is an embryo of soul or whether it's already a human soul. That's why Descartes says that Descartes, that's the philosopher, he said that the seat of the soul is the pineal gland. Whether it's an embryo of soul or whether it's You remember yourself and you feel yourself in the pineal gland. When you build the human within you, with the soma suchi kong, and then that is soul as well, that is controlled by willpower. And the seat of that soul is in the pineal gland. So from the pineal gland, you control your solar body of the mind, which utilizes the brain. And from the pineal gland, through your mind, you control your emotional solar body, which is called astral body, that manifests through the emotional brain, your heart. And, of course, you are in the physical body, remembering yourself as a human being. So we behold here, a human being is that entity that built the Soma Suchi Kong, physical, astral, mental bodies, vital bodies, the bodies of glory. That's a human being. Before that, we cannot call ourselves human beings. Humanoids will be better, or intellectual animas. Anima is soul in Latin, intellectual soul which the possibility of becoming human. But a real human, that's why, received that title when reaches Tiferet. Because that is the human, the spirit. And as a spirit, human, in a superior manas, Tiferet, in the tree of life, is how he sees God. God appears only through, only to the human being appears to his own image. So that appearance that you find in the Bible of angels are precisely that aspect of your own particular monad. Because when you said monad, you also can say spirit. You can also say Elohim. Or in Greek, angel, or malakim, many names. So if you remember, when Jesus is in the Mount of Olives, he sees an angel. That is his own particular individual God, his own particular angel. Elohim, if you want, his own particular Jehovah, if you want. And that's when Moses go to the same Mount of Sinai, he sees God there in the burning bush, a prince of fire. And the angel says there speaks to him. He says it's a superior part of the being. You want to talk with your being? Do you want to know who your being is? What is the name of your own spirit? Then you can receive that in the Mount of the Olives. In the Mount of Olives, in the Mount of Sinai, is how you see God face to face. Now it's coming into my mind these other uh, sacred scriptures 
the Mahabharata from India, which from it was extracted this beautiful book called the Bhagavad Gita, which is the talking of Krishna with Arjuna. And many times I told you that Arjuna, according to the Mahabharata, is different. Is a human soul. And Krishna, according to the Mahabharata, in the tree of life, is Chokhmah, wisdom, Christ. So that's why in this lecture we said the Christophany of the Bodhisattva, meaning how Christ manifests in front of the Bodhisattva and guides him. How God guides the human being. Or as the lecturer in the previous lecture talked about, he says, how once received the first law, the law of God, the will of God that will guide you. Because here in this physical plane, we have the Deuteronomy, the second law that is written for those that are blind, for those that cannot see God in themselves. Then you have to read the Ten Commandments or you have to read the other sacred scriptures where it is uh, written how to become a human being and how to develop your inner self. That's the second law. But the first law is for those here in Tiferet. And here is precisely when the, it happens that we call shamari, ecstasy, rapture, satori, which is beyond the mind. Because remember that the mind is netzah. In the sixth dimension is where we see the reality of oneself. Without the mind. Without thinking. When the mind is silenced. Completely empty. Then the embryo of soul. Or the human soul. Can escape. Through the pineal gland. Directly. Into the sixth dimension. Directly into the Mount of Olives and to experience his own particular monad, his own particular God, and to know the multifacet, or how you call the multiplicity within the unity. Comes into my mind this very moment, Arjuna and Krishna. When talking there, that great, the great battle that he is going to perform against himself. Of course, he is talking with Krishna in deep breath. And he kneels and asks to Krishna, Please, Krishna, show me your own reality, your divine presence. And then Krishna appears before Arjuna and he sees the universal face of Christ in front of himself. That is, of course, described in the Bhagavad Gita. That is a theophany or Christophany. Ezekiel, in the book of the Bible, he talks also about this theophany in which he sees God. But you have to understand that that phenomena, or this phenomenon, is happening in Tiferet. Because Ezekiel himself calls himself the son of man. And many times in different lectures we stated that the son of man is Tiferet. The, the human soul united with Krishna. United with Quetzalcoatl with Christ, with Aura Mazda, Avalokiteshvara, if you want, or Kukulkan, if you want. Because that entity that in the Tree of Life is called Chokhmah, receives many names in different religions. But this Christophany or Theophany of the Bodhisattva happens many times in different levels to the Bodhisattva. And here is precisely in Tifereth where 
the soul has to choose between the spiral path or the straight path. Obviously, the one that work developing the bodhicitta and helping the fellow man is already a bodhisattva in potentiality. So when he reaches here in Tifereth, he's already a human being. He's already a Soma Suchi Kong into the image of God. And he's ready to develop the Soma Neumati Kong. This is something very important for you to know. Only the Bodhisattva can develop the Neumaticon, which is the body of Christ. Because we have to bear also that within. And to bear that within means to practice sexual magic. Because that Neuma enters into the body and develops into the psychological atmosphere of the bodhicitta. That's why the Master Samael on the earth states, the bodhisattva develops and grows within the psychological atmosphere of the bodhicitta. We will say in Christian terms, the pneumaticon, the heavenly man, develops, grows, Within the neuma, I mean, within the uh, suchi kong, within the soma suchi kong, or the psychological man. So Christ cannot incarnate within those that didn't develop the soma suchi kong. It's not by raising your arm aloft and saying, I believe in Jesus, how Christ will descend. Now listen to this. In Romans chapter 8 verse 9, 10, 11, it is written this. But you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. It's talking about those that are already building the Soma Neumaticon, Christ. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. That Spirit of God that dwell in you is precisely that Christ that came into you after you build the bodies of glory, the Soma Suchikong. Now, if any man has, to, has not the Spirit of Christ, he is not of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin. But the spirit, is, the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quick your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwells in you. This chapter uh, of verse 11 is very important. Listen again. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus. You know that Jesus rose up that he resurrected. But Paul of Tarsus is saying here. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you. Who is that spirit that rose Jesus from the dead and dwells in you? He's talking about those individuals that are already bodhisattvas. That already reach the second birth. That already have the bodies of, of the soul within. And therefore they incarnated Christ because they want to go ahead in their psychological, spiritual development. So obviously, if that spirit is within you. He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken, quick, quicken your mortal bodies. Or will rose your, your immortal bodies. In other words, 
when you reach the second birth and you have the glorious body created, the image of God within you, you are before a dilemma. Because still you have the bodies of sin, the protoplasmic bodies, those bodies that push you to sin. And that's why when you read the Apostle Paul, he literally says that the inner man wants to do the spiritual things. But the sin, the, the, the sinner, the man that is ready with the natural bodies, the protoplasmic bodies, just wants to commit sin. And that's precisely a dilemma that always happens inside all of us. Whether we are being born again or whether we are starting. That natural, sinful nature that we have within always pushes to do the animal thing. The sinful thing. And that, of course, is related with lust, anger, greed, pride, envy, vanity, laziness, gluttony, etc. That is the natural sinful body that we have within, inside. And that pushes to do the sin. Why is it called sin? Because this bodies of sin perform acts in relation with nature, evolving or devolving acts. And those acts have nothing to do with the superior levels or what in the Bible is called the kingdom of heaven, the higher dimension. Here, the protoplasmic bodies fornicate and adulterate. But the bodies of glory do not fornicate, do not adulterate. They follow other laws, human laws. But when we are already with these bodies inside, created, then we have that dilemma. Because the bodies of sin pull us down. While the bodies of glory is always teaching us about the superior forces. Then we have to annihilate completely the bodies of sin. And that's a process which, in which we need patience. And that's why is Jesus in the, Mount of the, in the Mount of Olives kneeled down before his own angel. And he says, Father, if it is possible, take this cup from me. But not my will, but thine be done. He knows that he has to descend from the Mount of the Olives into the bodies of sin. And to start working with the annihilation by facing the karma of his own karma. Because karma exists within the four bodies of sin. Nesa, Hod, Yesod, Umakut. Mind, emotion, and physical aspect of us. This is what is related with karma. So Jesus knows that he has to face that karma in order to help. Christ, of course, descends. This is the Neuma. After receiving commandments from your inner being, you descend down. And then you have to face the three denials of Peter. Peter, of course, as you know, I said, is in relation with the signs of sexual transmutation. And uh, Jesus says to his disciples, all of you were the scandal of me this night. Because, as is written in the prophets, the shepherd is going to, to be uh, smite, will smite the shepherd, and all the sheep will scatter. Of course, uh, let me read for you in relation with, with this Mount of the Olives, in order for you to follow better what I said. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out into the Mount of Olives. And Jesus said unto them, All ye shall be offended because of me this night. For it is written, I will smite the shepherd, different, and the sheep shall be scattered. But after that I am risen, I will go before you into Galilee. 
But Peter said unto him, Although all shall be offended, yet will not I. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I said unto thee, That this day, even in this night, before the cock crow twice, thou shalt deny me thrice. But he spoke the more vehemently and said, If I should die with thee, I will not deny thee in any way. And likewise also said they all. And they came to the place which was named Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, Sit ye here while I shall pray. And he take with him Peter, faith, related with the pineal gland, and Jacobo, which in the Bible in English called James, which is in relation with prudence, with the pancreas, and John, which is in relation with love, which is behind the heart, the thymus gland, and began to be sore amazed and to be very heavy, and said unto them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful unto death. Tarry ye here and watch. And he went forward a little and fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me, nevertheless, nor what I will, but what thou wilt. And he, he came and find them sleeping, and said unto Peter, Simon, sleepest thou? Could not thou watch one hour with me? Pray, lest ye enter into temptation. The spirit truly is ready, but the flesh is weak. Your spirit is always ready, but your flesh is weak. And he asked three times, to Peter, watch and pray with me. But when he is praying and working in the world of Tifereth, he returns and he finds them sleeping. Do you realize that? It's very clear. Peter related with the pineal gland. We have to be always active, remembering oneself. Because we don't know when the Son of Man will come unto us. And we have to be awakened. But the Lord always is in the sixth dimension, doing the work for humanity. And when he descends into the pineal gland of all his disciples, he found them always sleeping. And that's why he says that Peter will deny him thrice before the logos, the rooster, sings twice. Of course, that's the symbol of the incarnation of Christ or the work of or the whole work that we have to perform. Because Peter is the one that denies the Lord. Of course, in the very rustic way, the way in which we deny the Lord is by fornicating. Those that prostitute the stone, which is the rock, sex, the foundation of God. Those that adulterate and fornicate, of course, they are denying the Christ. There are many Christians, many fundamentalists that believe in Christ, but they fornicate. So they deny the Lord, even though they love him and they study the doctrine. But if we want to really prove that we love the Lord, we have to prove it in the sex. By not denying him. Of course, Peter denied him thrice. That's a deep meaning, an alchemical work that we have to perform. Because, of course, the Lord has to fight against the lustful elements that we have within. In the beginning, with the signs of Peter, with the keys of Peter, which is the signs or the keys of alchemy, we descend to the ninth sphere, sex, to transmute. And there, we always face our lust or animal elements. And, unfortunately, we deny the Lord. Because the Lord, Christ, is chastity within us. But during the sexual act, lost acts, 
the last is very heavy. And uh, we succeed by performing and creating the solar bodies, the Soma Suchikong. That's the first denial. And then we are happy and see the Lord in the sixth dimension. Lord, I deny you, but behold, I succeed. Temptation. And now I am behind you and I see you face to face. And then the Lord says, well, but I told you, you have denied me thrice. And then Peter says, what? Go down again. Because now you have to build a pneumaticon. And for that, you have to fight and disintegrate all of those entities that were denying me that belongs to your psyche. And that's the second aspect of the issue that he descends again with Peter to work with alchemy and to perform what in Gnosticism we call the second mountain. Psychological work and where you have to annihilate all your ego. That is the most difficult denial because then you face all your psychological elements and you disintegrate them. You clean them. So when you reach the summit of the second mountain and you are free from ego, then you are before your Christ, the Theophany, the Christophany, you know, the manifestation before the Lord again. Here I am, Lord, and thanks to you and your help, you help me to annihilate my ego. Now I am saved. And then the Lord says, yes, but I told you that you will deny me thrice. And the angel says, what? You have to receive the qualifications. And for that, my friend, says the Lord, Satan had to tempt you and to test you. Eight years. That's the book of Job. That's the last denial. And in those eight years, the initial has to fight and to face other psychological elements more subtle in order to resurrect from the dead. You see, the resurrection only happens after the third denial. Because then the rooster sings. Which means that Christ is incarnated, the neuma is within you completely elaborated. But of course, for that you need the help of John, which is the psyche. And of James, which means you have to work with a lower level because James or Jacobo is in relation with the pancreas, with the stomach, with the liver, where all those negative vibrations, desires vibrate. And that's why it is written that Jesus take Jacobo, John, and Peter to the Mount of the Olives because they are the main elements of the psychological work that we had to perform. Jacobo works very profoundly with meditation and with the transformation of desire into willpower. And John, which is that psychological, our, our own essence, our own soul, rests his head on the heart of Jesus. That meaning that he's receiving instructions, psychological instructions in order to perform the work from the heart, from the atom nous, which is the Lord, which is the neuma. And Peter, of course, is his sign. He has to go into the ninth sphere in the sexual act to work hard in those levels. And that's precisely the cup that Jesus is receiving from the angel. This cup that they said is the Holy Grail. That Holy Grail, of course, is in relation with the woman. Malkut has to go down and to face all of those sinful elements that we have within. And that is sacrifice of the Lord in the Mount of the Olives. To face that, to understand that is really painful. Especially for those that are being born again. Because when you are in the sixth dimension as a soul already built as a Soma Suchikong, 
into the image of God, you want to enjoy nirvana or heaven. You don't want to go down to return into the physical world. You want to be there and happy with your inner being, with your monad. But then he says, no, I want to take the straight path and you have to go down again because I don't want to become a Hannah's Noose, double polarity. I have to become a Bodhisattva and the Bodhicitta has to develop completely. So go down and work in the Neuma and the other aspect. Bear the Neuma says, as you born the Suchi Kong. Do you see? That's our chemical statement. That is why we said that Paul of Tarsus was a Gnostic alchemist that was teaching and delivering the knowledge to those that already knew about this. It's not that he says, oh, you believe in Jesus, or believe in this, or believe in that, or bear the image in your imagination of these two things that I'm saying here, and you are done. The process of acquiring the second birth is a psychological, alchemical, cabalistical process in which we are being born again and we are learning the language of the internal world. That language of the internal world is written in the book of Revelation. That's why I said that Jacobo, James, Santiago is represented with a pumpkin which symbolizes the mind and the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation is a book of symbols. It's a language that you have to learn. But listen carefully. The language that you have to learn is a language we, the Gnostic, use in order to teach. But you have to comprehend and to elaborate that language by meditating, by transforming your desire from your pancreas, from your liver, from all of those appetites in this area which are in relation with James, Jacobo, in order to have light in your pumpkin, in order to become a hollow wind, hallowed, a holy man, after you face all the demons of Halloween, which are within you. That's the mystery of James, Jacobo. And for that, then you are developing and understanding the language of God. And then you understand the signs of Peter, etc. And that's precisely what in Gnosticism we call it Theophany or Christophany. It's something that you develop inside. Of course, it is written by uh, Gnostics, by like Paul in his epistle. All the written of Paul of Tarsus, the letters which are after the four Gospels, are Kabbalistic, alchemistic. You don't read them just like that and try to interpret them with the dictionary. You have to know Kabbalah in alchemy in order to know what Paul is talking about. Otherwise, you fall into different mistakes as the fundamentalists in this day and age, unfortunately, fell. Because they repeat, repeat what Paul says, but they don't know what they, they are talking about. They already think that they are the Soma Suchi Kong. But they only are, the having within is the bodies of sin that all of us have. Now we have to annihilate. Because that bodies of sin has to be dead. Let me read to end with this. What is written in Romans 6, verse 6. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is free from sin. The old man that Paul talks in this uh, verse is precisely the protoplasmic bodies, the sinful bodies that must be crucified with our Lord because the Neuma, the Spirit, Christ, takes the sins of the world 
of the sinful world and crucify them with him. Annihilate them. In the sixth dimension, in Tifereth, the Lord Christ, incarnated in the body Salva, passes for tremendous suffering in order to annihilate the karma of that initiate and completely liberate him and transform him into a bodhisattva, which means into a vehicle of the light. Do you have a question? Yeah. Yes. Judas Tateos or Judas Iscariot? Iscariot? Judas Iscariot is in relation with the sexual glands. He, he always betrays the Lord. Your own Judas betrays the Lord. My own Judas betrays the Lord. And that's why he's the only disciple that dies. Meaning, all the sexual, animalistic activity of our sexual glands have to die completely. That is Judas. And that's why Judas has the treasure, the money, which is the force. You see? So the Lord needs Judas. But Judas has to understand that he has to die, has to be hanged at the end. This is what we have to understand. In the beginning, we start as Judas. Because we have the bodies of sin. And we transmute lust into chastity. We transmute anger into sweetness. And we do a psychological transformation. And Judas always is there in the sex ready to betray us if we are not careful. Because he's in relation with the bodies of sin. But once we annihilate or Judas, because Judas, you know, he, he realizes that he has to die. The same way we have to realize that. But that's a process. It's not one moment in which you hang yourself in the tree of good and evil. Acknowledging this is No. This is a process. That hanging is a very long process. Until Judas completely dies. That we are going to talk in the next lecture. After in 15 days. Which is the continuation when we enter into the world of Gebura. So do you have another question? Well, the question is, does the Bodhisattva have to face limbo? Yeah, of course. That's precisely the pain of Jesus in the Mount of the Olives. Understanding that he has to face limbo and to face hell. It is written that when the Lord died, he descends into hell. And then he resurrects from the dead. To go inside of hell means to go into the subconscious, infraconscious, into the bodies of sin, into the protoplasmic bodies that we have that like to fornicate, the adulterate, the, the anger, and all that elements that we have within. So, when you create the body of liberation in Malkut, you have that body which is not a sinful body, but still, you have your physical body, as all of us have physical bodies. And you utilize the sinful bodies in order to manifest in this society. Because this Humanity, this society, utilizes the protoplasmic bodies. This is what this civilization is, of protoplasmic bodies, of sinful bodies. That's why everybody worships lust, pride, vanity, gluttony. Watch TV or watch any movie, you will see there violence, etc. That's related with the protoplasmic bodies. So we are in this society. Everybody worships the beast. So we have to face it. All of them have the mark of the beast because they have the protoplasmic bodies within. And we have to go and teach them that they are beasts and not men 
as uh, this great philosopher, how do you call this, von Ries, because was famous because of his, uh, how do you know? No, no, uh, the one that was saying that was looking for a man in the city of Athens, Diogenes. Diogenes was looking a lamp in the midday, a man in the city of Athens. He said, what are you looking for, Diogenes? I'm looking for a man. And he says, but the men are here in the supermarket, in the markets, in the houses, in the offices in Athens. There are a lot of men. No, no, no. They are beasts, he says. They are not men. They eat like beasts. They fornicate like beasts. They go and do the same thing that the beasts do. And he went in all the city of Athens and he didn't find a man. Everybody was feeling insulted because uh, he went into his, uh, he was living in a barrel went back into the barrel and he didn't find a man that he was looking for. Sarcasm. That was Diogenes. Uh, Alexander the Great, uh, yeah. Alexander the Great uh, was in front of him and says, Diogenes, what do you want me to do for you? He says, can you move away from the sunlight, please, because you are making me shade. Thank you. So this is what he says to this great conqueror. You know what I mean? Protoplasmic bodies. Diogenes knew about these signs. And this is the way, you know. So therefore, of course, when you build the bodies of glory, the Soma Suchi Kong within you, it doesn't mean that the bodies of sin are going to disappear by magic. As the fundamentalists believe. That when you believe in Jesus, then they disappear. No, the bodies of sin continue there. And you have to incarnate the Lord in order to annihilate that. And that's a process of alchemy. A long process. It's not a matter of lifting your arm aloft and you say, okay, this is it. Now you are free of sin. No. It's a process. That's why you have to understand. And for that you have to know about meditation. The uh, story about the bodhicitta and to become a bodhisattva, which is precisely the contrary of the sravaka and buddha pratyeka. And that's what is called Gnosticism. Pure Gnosticism in order to transform humanity. But you have to do it in yourself. And of course, as a Bodhisattva, you descend to Limbo. And not only to Limbo. You can descend as Dante, which is a Bodhisattva, descending into Hell. And to see all of those elements because all the nine layers of Hell in Dante, Divine Comedy, is a description of all the elements that we have within protoplasmic elements that we have to disintegrate that belong to Klippoth, which is below Malkut in the tree of life. Which people call hell. Of course. That's precisely a great dilemma. And many initiates that achieve the second birth, that they build the Soma Suchi Kong, they don't disintegrate the bodies of sin. They continue with them. They become Hanas Musen. Double polarity is represented in Greek mythology with the centaur. Half man, half beast. And that's precisely an abortion of nature. And that's precisely what we don't want to be. We have to disintegrate the animal in order to become a true human being. Let us, Hercules, Heracles, help us with his 12 tasks. Do you have another question? Yeah? Well, yeah, I th at the, in the end. In the, uh, at the end, because uh, symbolically speaking, we always say it takes about 40 years. Which is, but this is symbolic. But literally, if you work really hard, you can do it in four, 40 years. This 40 years is in relation with the letter Mem, which is water. Remember that the Ark of Nova was 40 days in the ocean. And the Israelites were 40 years in the wilderness. That's a symbol in which you have to work psychologically in yourself. 40, with the three factors. But uh, at the end of those 40 years is when you have to pass for the eight years of job. The the Apostle Job or the same Job 
in which you had to qualify what you did. But when you read the book of Job, that's the last denial of Peter, in which you are being tested. And if you succeed and pass the ordeal of Job, and that is the, th the third denial of Peter, and then the Lord completely incarnates in you. Of course, uh, nobody can pass that ordeal of eight years with the ego alive. It's impossible. Only after the annihilation of the ego, you can be tested in that way. So, thank you very much. And uh, within 15 days, we continue in Gebura in relation with this Christianity and Next Saturday is Buddhism in relation with the same thing but in the Buddhist way in order to you to comprehend that Buddhism and Christianity belong to each other. The same thing. To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Gloria and Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Amen.